So I have this bad habit of explaining my hobbies to strangers in bars. And when you explain that you do reverse engineering, one of the first things that they ask you is like, so do you see the ones and the zeros? And I used to explain, no, we use hexadecimal and all this other crap that they didn't care about. Because um, it's true, like, you know, it makes more sense that way. Um, if we could jump back to the, there we go. So this is a picture of a 100 kilobit program. Um, this particular program is from the third generation Clipper chip, also called Forteza. This was uh, backdoored cryptography by the US government. The idea was that us mere mortals could not be trusted with good cryptography. Um, but they also didn't want like the Russians or the French listening into us. So we would be allowed to buy this cryptography. This is an algorithm called Skipjack. We would be allowed to buy it, but only as hardware, not as software. And uh, there would be a key escrow system as a backdoor, so that when you buy one of these cards, it comes preloaded with a key. That key is registered in a government database. If you have a warrant, you can look up the key in the database and figure out the session key for the communication, and you can then decrypt all of the conversations. Um, there have been, there's been prior work, uh, most of it by Matt Blaze, on uh, how this card works, how to write drivers for it, um, potential ways to get around these restrictions. Like there's um, a 16-bit checksum that is the only thing that's really validated as far as the key escrow goes. So if you can brute force a collision on that 16-bit checksum, you can get a secure connection even though you're lying about your participation in the key escrow system. A more complete break would be to have what's called the family key. If you have the family key, you can decrypt and encrypt the structure that contains the, um, the serial number of the participants, the encrypted session key, and the checksum and you could just rewrite that session key to be wrong while keeping the checksum correct, reseal it, and have good cryptography despite using tampered equipment. Um, back in grad school, I was introduced to this chip. Uh, I was even given one, and back then I did not know how to read the program out. But now I do, so I'm going to share that with you fine folks. As a quick reminder, um, there are different types of memories. Things like flash ROM and EEP ROM and FRAM, they store data non volatilely but they are, they're written in the field. Um, those you cannot easily photograph. There's another type called mask ROMs, and these are written in a mask at the semiconductor factory when the chip is being manufactured, and they are set in stone for the entirety of their lifetime. Um, the bits do not change. The bits are what they are, and they are the same on every chip that rolls off of that production line. You can customize these for your own use, but only in very large quantities. Uh, minimum order might be 10,000 units because an entire mask needs to be made for it. So you usually find these as things like bootloaders that are very high volume, um, maybe throw away on chips that have very little field programmable memory because there's no need to differentiate them. Um, so they're programmed in the factory. Um, they c they're wired up to the chip in different ways. So sometimes you'll find code in them, sometimes you'll find data in them, sometimes it'll be like a regular memory, like the sort of thing that you would read and write in your machine code. Other times they're microcode. Um, so sometimes when you find one of these things in a chip, you'll find that almost all of the bits are zeros and there are a few ones scattered around. And that's not the program, that's the instruction set. And reverse engineering that might teach you that it's an 8051 or tell you what some undocumented opcodes do, but it, it won't give you the behavior. You really want the code ones. Um, this also requires chemical pre-processing. These things are sometimes visible from the surface, but the majority are not. So in addition to decapping, you also need to do delayering, and sometimes you need to stain the ones to be a different color than the zeros, because in some chips they're the same color. 
Um, these are great for like old school video game copy production schemes. Um, John McMaster and some of his co-authors did an excellent talk here a few years back where they reverse engineered the copy protection chip in the Nintendo 64 by the same photography technique. Um, and in, this, in the case of this chip, um, I think that they did it as a mask ROM in order to make the card harder re to reverse engineer. So you could read some of this card out by taking the, the external memory chips over to a new board and just reading them like anything else with an EEPROM programmer. But the internal memory, you can't do that. And there's no documented debugging pins. There's no like JTAG in that generation. Um, so photography became the most expedient way for me to read this. Um, here's an example of a mask ROM. Um, this is a lookup table for the skipjack encryption algorithm. When this chip was designed, this table was classified. It, we're going to zoom in on just the right half of this. Um, and as we zoom in, um, you can kind of see that there are those like little blue spots that are above and below the squares in the middle of each row. And those little blue spots are ones. And if there is no blue spot, that's a zero. I wrote a CAD tool for working with these. And the way that my CAD tool works is that I place row and column lines over these bits. So that rather telling it where every bit is, I only tell it where every row is and every column, and that way I'm, you know, I'm doing the square root of the work. Like some of those algorithmic improvements that you slept through as an undergrad are useful in terms of limiting human labor as well as machine labor. After I've marked them up, my software will run through and identify each of them photographically. Um, here are all of the reds are ones and all of the blues are zeros. Uh, and uh, an interesting chemical effect is that on many of these things, the ones will be darker than the zeros until some point in the chemical reaction when they flip and you read them the other way. Uh, so very often you need to um, invert all of the bits in your project in order to make things line up. Before I began, there were um, two bit extraction programs that were publicly available. Uh, one is called ROMPAR by Adam Laurie. Uh, this is like a Python program where you draw um, a grid and then it samples in the grid. Um, a matching one was uh, Bitracked by Chris Gerlinski, which I think was written first but published later. It's in Borland C++ 5 and it depends upon a commercial ActiveX control. So I've never gotten that one to compile, um, but a pre-built version is floating around. Um, and their job is to take the photograph and to give you the ones and the zeros. There's a matching tool that you need, um, which converts those physical order ones and zeros into logical order bytes. Because when you're reverse engineering something, you want all of the bits of a word to be together rather than scattered apart in the way that the chip would physically have them. Um, Again, there are two open source tools for this. Zorom by John McMaster is a suite of Python scripts that work by text manipulation. So they will swap around rows, they will sample in different ways, they have different strategies. And uh, part of this is like um, a solver. You tell the solver some guesses about what you expect will be in the ROM. For example, um, a Z80 ROM will usually begin by setting the stack pointer. Whereas a modern ARM ROM will usually begin with um, a stack pointer value and then some interrupt handler addresses. And an antique ROM will begin with a bunch of um, branch instructions to interrupt handlers because at some point in the past, ROM, uh, ARM used to have its interrupt table as a list of instructions rather than a list of addresses. Um, it flips everything around, and if your guesses are correct, and your ROM is one of the roughly 50% that the solver works for, it will give you one or two solutions, and then you can manually figure out which one is the correct one. Uh, a different tool with a wildly different design is BitViewer by Chris Gerlinski, which 
is a graphical tool that allows you to kind of manipulate the bits and then also view the result in hexadecimal. And you play with it and you think really hard and at the end of it you can understand it. Um, today I'm going to tell you how I wrote a new bit extractor which solves the first part of this problem. I'm hoping that I can come back next year and tell you that I have a great and better solution for the conversion problem. But at the moment, I'm still either using Zorom or I'm thinking really hard and writing some Python scripts. Um, so let's quickly go through the chemistry of these things. Um, we're gonna depackage the chip first. So you're gonna need a minimum of 65% nitric acid. If you're lazy or if the chips are old, you really want this shit, which is um, red fuming nitric acid. Um, this stuff is, has so little water in it. It's like more than 90% nitric acid, but it's also less than 2% water. And the water acts as a catalyst that causes the acid to burn the bonding wires. With red fuming nitric acid having so little water, a rust will form on top of all of the exposed metal and it preserves it against the acid. So you can do live decapping with this stuff, whereas you cannot do it with the 65%. Um, so we take the chips, we drop them into the beaker, and we add a bit of the acid. We then uh, heat it. And you can see that this liquid is turning green, and it's turning green because metals have uh, been torn apart by the acid, and they're now floating around in it. That will also buffer the reaction against the plastics. So if you're on a dual inline package chip, one of the old ones where, um, like in my great grandfather's day when the legs would actually go through the, the board, those you wanna cut the pins off first and you would really rather use the stronger acid because there's so much metal in the pins that it will buffer the rest of the reaction and it takes forever and you need to swap uh, batches of acid. Um, eventually the chip kind of crumbles apart and then you get the glass itself in the middle this is the real microchip, and it is a lot smaller than the package that you're working with, especially in antique chips. When you look at um, like an Apple II or a Commodore 64, or one of these vintage computers, and you see dual inline package chips with a giant piece of plastic, and all of those pins with the 0.1 inch header, or 2.54 millimeter, or whatever the hell you call it in Canada, the, um, the actual die in the middle of that is just as small as a modern surface mount chip. Um, they just didn't have the PCB manufacturing capacity to, or technology to shrink the package further. Um, there are a couple of hobbyists that use sandpaper in order to shrink down the packages and then they move the dual inline package parts over to modern surface mount boards so they can do like uh, a handheld Nintendo uh, using the vintage chips. In any case, at the end of this, you get the dye and you clean it off in isopropyl alcohol and an acetone. You do not mix the isopropyl alcohol and the red fuming nitric acid. Does anyone know why? I got a hand back there. That's Olivier. What does it do? It's rocket fuel, yeah. Um, if you do it in very small quantities, it just does like a, a little pop. Um, I've never tried it in large quantities because I don't have a death wish. Um, here's the, the glass. Uh, you can see it on the center of the microscope slide, and then we can photograph it. So this is a tiny little chip under minimum magnification. Usually I need more detail than this, than the, the camera can, can read. So what I do is I take a series of photographs while moving the stage. So I'll do this one, and then I'll move it just a little bit, and then I'll move it just a little bit more. And I can take that series of photographs, and I can then line them up. So I can have like these three, as they fit on top of each other, and then I can combine that into a panorama. And with a ROM, I need a lot of detail because I need to see all of the individual bits of the entire program in one photograph. And so for that, I will take many, many different photographs and combine them at the end. The, there are different programs for stitching this together. Um, I've been using Huggin. I'm also trying um, uh, a new project by McMaster called uh, Cloud Stitch. The end result though in all of these tools is that you want one photograph of either the chip as a whole or of the region of the chip that you are reverse engineering. Um, this particular chip does not have an exposed ROM on it. If it did, I would probably make um, a photograph of just that ROM 
under higher magnification while ignoring the rest of the chip so that I didn't have like the, the file sizes grow for no useful reason. Um, your next problem is that as you do it to that stage, the chip bits are not visible from the surface. They are in some devices, like if you boil down the CPU in a Game Boy, the Game Boy boot ROM, the thing that makes the Nintendo logo come in from the top of the screen, that is surface visible. It's called a VIA ROM. Um, for diffusion ROMs and for implant ROMs, that doesn't happen. Uh, diffusion ROMs have the bits in the diffusion layer, and basically if you have a spot there, you have a working transistor, and that's a one. If you have no spot there, you do not have a working transistor, and that's a zero. Um, in order to get these out, we use hydrofluoric acid. Um, you can conveniently buy this in North America as rust stain remover. Um, do be careful with this stuff, though, because it will turn your bones to chalk, and if you go to the emergency room after being exposed to it, they will give you a psychiatric referral and will not do anything to help you in the, the meantime. You also have to use a plastic beaker. If you use a glass beaker, then hydrofluoric acid, like the reason why we're using it is that it dissolves glass. So if you put that in a glass beaker, it will start taking the beaker apart and that will buffer your reaction and ruin your glassware and does nothing to help. Um, I was talking to a buddy who worked for a while in um, a Chinese lab that was using hydrofluoric acid and they had a broken fume hood. So like all of the windows near the chemistry station had fogged over from the hydrofluoric acid gas reaching the window and then etching it. Um, I have a sketchy lab myself, but not that sketchy and everyone needs to draw a line in the sand somewhere for safety. Um, so this is a chip on the surface. Um, I think this is from Texas Instruments. You'll see that there are all of these little squares on the surface. This is like filler material in order to make sure that there's something in that region even though um, nothing is really needed there. Um, it increases the manufacturing yield because less material needs to be taken off of that layer. In order to remove it, we just boil the chip in hydrofluoric acid, clean it with water, and um, you can see that like here at the surface, a lot of the features are, are kind of hidden from us. But as we remove them, we can then clearly see different organs of this chip. And we can even go a bit deeper. And you can see that like in the center here, there is um, like a sea of gates surrounded by three memories. And there's another memory up in the top left. And um, there's a teeny little one here in the center at the bottom. Um, Similarly, if we want a diffusion ROM, we need to get rid of the stuff that's above it. Here's a photograph of a diffusion ROM. Uh, if you look just in the center, there's kind of like a figure eight pattern, and then some legs are missing from the figure eight. Um, these horizontal lines are covering up those bits, and they, you can see that they have little circles that connect to a circle at the lower level. That's called a via, that's a vertical connection between two layers, and that's how we connect to the bits in the chip. But to read them visually, we need all of that gone. So a little bit of nitric acid, oh sorry, of hydrofluoric acid exposure will begin to lift those top layers and begin to let you see what's beneath. A lot of it will obliterate those top layers and give you a very clear view of what's beneath. There's uh, a third type that I don't have time for in this lecture, but you can read about online, called an implant ROM. And the difference between a diffusion ROM like this and an implant ROM is that an implant ROM uses a difference between p-silicon and n-silicon to mark a bit, to like fix or break the transistor. p-silicon and n-silicon are the same damn color. So even if you photograph them perfectly, you can't really tell the difference between them. For those, you need to use something called a dash etch to stain the ones to be darker than the zeros in order to see the difference. And then you can photograph it just like the others. Um, okay, so we're done with the chemistry. Let's now take our photographs and begin working on the chip. Um, we are going to begin by marking all of the rows and all of the columns. We do this by drawing lines. Wherever the lines cross each other, that's where the bit is as far as the software is concerned. 
if the bits have a weird look to them, which they will in this example, we might intentionally try to hit like the edge of the, the bit rather than the center of the bit. Um, at some point, we're going to build this up to a threshold between a one and a zero. The software needs to look at the color of each bit, and from that color, it needs to say, yes, this is a one because it's bright enough, or no, this is a zero because it's dark enough. Um, if we get that backward, there's like a feature to flip them all. We also need to force some bits. When we mark this, we will not get all of them right. And sometimes when you get one wrong, it is easier for you to correct that individual mistake rather than move the entire line that it's a part of and potentially damage other bits. Um, we also, um, you know, be because these bit errors are such a problem, like imagine reverse engineering code and the byte of the instruction is wrong and you think it's a branch, but it's actually a conditional branch. Um, a lot of effort has been put into um, sort of correcting and identifying these errors. So we've got design rule checks. If you hit the letter V in my tool, it will highlight all of the bits that are close to the color threshold, and it will tell you you probably screwed up here. The same if you have bits overlapping, or if you have, um, uh, or if you have like rows that have a different number of bits than each other, it will identify that and highlight it for you. So here's our first ROM extraction. Um, I want you to look at this and I want you to see where the ROM is. It's toward the right, not completely on the right edge. And uh, you can see that there are like um, kind of shapes played in it that the right side of it is usually darker than the left side of it until you get to the bottom, and that the bottom has a large portion that's kind of bright. When you look at the ROMs from a distance at low magnification, <coughs> those sorts of observations are useful because that helps you figure out which direction to order the bits in. If you see a large chunk of white space at the bottom like you do here, Maybe those are all zeros because the memory has ended and there's nothing more to put in it. Um, if you see one column being darker than another column, in risk, that usually means that they're different bits of significance within the word. This particular chip is, um, this is the song For Elise by Beethoven from uh, an electronic doorbell. Uh, if you power this chip up, it will play that song forever on its only I.O. pin, and the other two pins are just power and ground. Uh, very high technology for the mid-70s. So you can now see in this, um, in this view, we've got all of these different bits. The bits here look like um, a little brown square with two blue sides to them that are in the kind of... Um, checkerboard or chessboard positions. And if you don't see that, that's a zero. In the software, you just load this up as a picture. You zoom in. Um, like any other software, you can pinch zoom or control in your mouse wheel. And in this image, I've laid uh, three row lines. The row lines cross through every bit. And they go um, across the entire image if you're able, but if there's tearing, you'll kind of stop halfway and uh, start a new line at maybe a slightly different angle to cover up your photography mistake. And when you get to very many photographs being stitched together, it becomes more likely that you have a photography mistake somewhere. And if it's a minor one, you might prefer to ignore it for now and touch it up later. And the software supports that. You then draw uh, column lines. So here's a column on the left, and you'll note that I'm not going through the very center of the bit, I'm going through the edge of it. The software does have a feature where you can kind of make your sampling wider and grab the darkest piece within that, uh, but that feature did not exist as this image was being taken. As that column line drops, the software then identifies that uh, these four bits exist where the rows have crossed the columns. And then I repeat this for the entirety of the chip, and I now know where all of the bit positions are. 
knowing where they are, I next need to sample them to figure out what color to use. So um, the way that you choose the color is that the software gives you a histogram of your three color channels of red, green, and blue. Uh, I don't have support for CMYK yet. Um, if you have a camera with very weird stuff, I guess that could be figured out. So um, I then have sliders for my red, green, and my blue channels, and I need to pick one of them with a bimodal distribution. I want there to be a very strong mountain of ones and a very strong mountain of zeros, and I want there to be a valley in between with hopefully zero bits, so that everything is clearly on one side or the other. Um, in this case, green is kind of an acceptable answer, but you see that red has a much wider separation. So we're going to do it the wrong way first. We're going to slide out the green threshold until it sits between those two hills. And the trouble with that is that some of the bits are wrong. Um, like if you look at the, the white arrow, that's red, but it ought to be blue. It thinks that that's a one, it ought to be a zero. And where there's one error, there's generally more than one. So I have these positions, I know that they're wrong, even though it looks like it's sampling it at the right place. If I then flip f from doing a threshold in green to doing a threshold in red, and you can see from this graph on the bottom right that red has a, a much wider separation between the two bits, um, all of those wrong bits get corrected. So like this is green, this is red. This is green, this is red. And so by correcting that threshold, you're then able to correct mountains of errors all at once, accurately identify all of the differences, and move on with your life. Now, this doesn't quite identify all of the errors in the ROM. Another problem that we have um, are like bits that are very close to the threshold. These aren't necessarily wrong, but they're untrustworthy because you know, they're, they're right on the line and we don't like them. Um, so these pop up as design rule check warnings, um, along with inconsistent row counts or overlapping bits. So as I hit V in my application, I then get a, a list of all of the potential errors. So like this blue bit is ambiguous and it's also wrong, and that little yellow box around the bit tells me so. And by clicking on them in this list, I can then jump to that position. Um, th this blue bit is ambiguous, but it happens to be correct. This is blue, it should be blue. Um, we're still warned about it because it could have been wrong and we want to be better safe than sorry. In each of these, we can uh, force the bit. We can say, like, I looked at it, I as a human being say that it, it's a one, you as a machine will do what I tell you to, please stop complaining about this. That then places a green square around it and it then no longer appears within the warning list. So you can kind of burn down the warnings that you have, like uh, graphical CAD software and unlike compiler warnings in, um, in software development, which usually are a mistake and just not a, not a major one. Um, so we now have like all of these bits marked, but what we really want is the program. Like if you had the option, you would never mess with this ROM, you would just read it out electrically. And in order to get to that, I have a series of export plugins. So you can export it as uh, ASCII art, which just gives you a text file. Um, if you're a sadist or an engineering student, you can put it in uh, CSV for use in like Microsoft Excel or MATLAB. Um, you can do just the JSON bit positions. So if you're doing something really weird and you need to move it into software that you've written yourself, you can import everything that I know about those bits as JSON and then run your own stuff from there. You can also do uh, Python matrix. Like some people like to do um, matrix manipulation in order to eventually get the bytes out. Um, I think that those people are wizards and they frighten me, but they're accurate. And, um, um, and then in addition to these things that might go into another program, there are some that are rather well understood 
that can just go out directly. So I have support for dumping Mark IV ROM bytes. This is like an old 4-bit Atmel instruction that Adam Laurie wrote a great uh, paper about uh, as, as part of his competing tool. Um, and then for ARM6, which is used in the Clipper chip, uh, I also just wrote a driver for it, so you can dump that out as a main uh, binary file that you can load in Ida Pro or in Ghidra and reverse engineer as software. Um, the ASCII dump seems to be standard for moving between these sorts of tools. So if I want to run this in one of the tools that um, Chris Gerlinski or that John McMaster wrote, I just export it to ASCII art, and then their software will take it in as ASCII art, and we don't have to argue over formats. Um, and you could do larger programs this way. So um, this is a photograph of the main ROM from the Nintendo Game Boy. Uh, I dumped this photographically. I dumped the bits out. I decoded them. At the end of that, it exactly matched the MD5 checksum that I found in the MAME collection. Not that MAME would ever distribute binaries. Um, and I've got a tutorial on this. So if you look up my tool after this lecture, um, you can download just this photograph. And then by following the instructions in the readme, by the end of the readme, you will then have decoded this yourself, um, getting all of the bits by your own markup and using the tools yourself with no, um, no bytes given to you. Um, it really helped that, this was that I wrote this in QT6. Because I get all of the performance advantages of it. Like um, when I draw my rows and my columns, those are just Q graphics line items. Um, the bits are rectangle items. And this means that I can use all of QT's algorithms for like identifying collisions and overlaps. It also means that the rendering is very, very fast. Because all of the 2D acceleration that is unique to my operating system is brought into play. Um, at some point, I'm going to be adding OpenGL support, and that works with the same C++ classes. So, you know, um, there will just be a day where I say, okay, we're going to do this in OpenGL instead of doing this in software, and it will instantly convert. Um, it's important to align the bits. As I mark these rows and these columns, I'm doing it on a photograph, and there's a bit of tilt to it and a bit of drift. So it sometimes becomes confusing to know like where one row begins and the next ends or the other way around. Um, so I found that it, it's helpful to just sort all of the bits by the x-coordinate. So you're like sliding left to right within the picture. And as you slide left to right, uh, you're encountering bits one at a time. If you do this and everything is perfectly vertical, then you will get all of the bits in the first column before you get any bits in the second column. If you do this when it's tilted, you will begin by getting bits out of the first column, and then at some point, you will begin getting bits of the second column while you're not yet finished with the first. Um, so with a little trickery, you can eventually get this to where you know all of the bits of the first column, and then you just slide left to right, and you drop each bit into whatever had the most similar Y value. And then you get a linked list of every row and a linked list of all of the row starters. And then you can begin um, treating these as like a, a table rather than individual positions. Um, another very important thing that um, I learned from making mistakes as a programmer earlier in my career is that if you can't test the code and you can't run it on the command line interface, pieces of your GUI will atrophy from lack of use and they'll break, and you won't find out until it's a problem. So from the very beginning, I wrote this as both a GUI and as a command line tool. Um, I have make files that will compile every ROM that I have ever reverse engineered back into the original binary files and flag errors for me if any new warnings have been introduced or if the output file does not meet the MD5 checksum that I expect. Um, the, um, uh, and then this being like um, the same executable as the GUI, you can also use this to quickly load something up, run particular tests on it, that sort of stuff. So let's get to the Clipper chip now. 
So now we've got a tool that can reverse engineer mask ROMs. We've got some mask ROMs, so we need to move on to secret ones. This is the MYK78, the original clipper chip from Microtronics. Um, it and a series of successors, like the MYK80 and the MYK82, were written up in, um, in papers by Matt Blaze, who is given a sample card by the NSA in order to play around with this and look for security mistakes. Um, one of the mistakes that he found was that you could collide um, you could collide like a checksum that was used cryptographically in order to make a connection that did not reveal the key escrow. Like um, it did not reveal what key to the NSA should look up in their database. Um, even though the recipient, the other person that you're talking to was fully compliant with the protocol and believed that the message was exposed. Um, he also explained some cryptographic tricks for like building a secure cryptographic algorithm out of the backdoored cryptographic algorithm. Like you could um, do your key escrow dance, get a shared secret that was revealed as you're like talking to each other in the same room, and then reuse that months later when you're in different countries. And because that's not being resent, it's not a part of the, the key escrow dance. Um, this is a, a photograph of the MYK78 that I took ages ago. And here in the bottom left are these two little lookup tables. On the newer Clipper chip, the one that's in the PCMCIA card that I've been reverse engineering lately, the structure looks slightly different, but all of the bits are the same. Um, this structure has these bits. And these bits are this table, which is the F table from the, uh, from the Skipjack cryptographic algorithm that was classified at the time this chip was first released. So you can reverse engineer secret cryptography by reading the hardware implementation of it and identifying all of the bits in that implementation. The newer one um, is a bit more sophisticated. It has a chip in it called the MYK82 which looks like this. And in addition to the lookup tables there in the top, those are the ones that were in the bottom of the other chip, there's a CPU in the upper right, and there's a very large mask ROM on the far left. This CPU is an ARM6, and ARM is great because I understand it. It's not a, not a dead architecture. ARM6 is quite old. Um, it does not have support for the thumb instruction set. So every word of this program is 32 bits long. Um, it does not support things like unaligned accesses or um, bite-wise or half-word accesses. So you can only read or write 32 bits at a time. And if you try to look this up, it, it's early enough. It's like a, an early 90s design that most of the literature you can find on it is not in the form of data sheets, but in the form of propaganda articles about how efficient ARM is and how it's so much better than, um, than CISC microcontrollers. Um, but keep in mind, this is before thumb. Every single instruction is wasting 32 bits in this program. And the bits are encoded as a diffusion ROM. Um, here are some zoomed in. There are the little um, purple rectangles that are above or below each square on the center of the line. If we zoom out and see all of them, a couple of patterns become apparent. Um, as you look at this, uh, what do you think that giant row of lighter color at the bottom is? Does anyone have a guess? Yes. No, no, at the bottom, at the bottom. So the bottom here, there are zeros. The condition code is on the right. If you look at the two major columns on the right, right you, you see, see that the, 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 the rightmost of the, the really big columns, that's entirely dark for the portion that's used. And then the one to the left of it, the right side is dark and the left side is light. Each of these major columns, we have 16 of them, in a 32-bit architecture, 
how wide do you think a bit of significance is? Well, it's half of the major column because that way you, you have 32 of them. So reading from right to left, you have dark, 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 light. One, 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 zero. And what is the unconditional execution code on ARM? It's an E. So from just those two things, that the bottom is empty, usually the end of your program is empty and you begin your code from the beginning. So we're probably starting at the top and working our way down. And then um, this 1110 thing on the right tells us that the dark ones are probably the ones, the light ones are probably the zeros, and we probably read each word from the right side all the way over to the left side. Now, within each column, you have, uh, I forget whether it's eight or 16 words in each row. So those are also read starting on the right and working your way to the left. And you'll know that you got this right in a couple of different ways. One tell is that when you start looking at these as 32-bit um, as values, um, wherever you see E at the beginning of a 32-bit word, that's the unconditional execution code. That's the same as the 1110 sequence that we saw graphically. Um, you'll also note that this begins with uh, a lot of EA instructions. Um, Who's enough of a nerd to tell me what uh, an ARM instruction beginning with EA is? Yes. So these are all branch instructions for interrupt handlers. These are all identifying that um, the CPU landed on that instruction and it's going to branch to the actual handler of that instruction. Now a lot of you do re ARM reverse engineering and a lot of you are saying, wait, that's total bullshit. That should be an address and not an instruction. And on modern, ROM, uh, on modern ARM, you would be correct. But in this generation, the interrupt table was made up of instructions rather than addresses of handlers. So certain details change over the years, even though the backward compatibility is, is rather deep. Um, we can then get a simple little program that will convert this whole um, collection of bits all the way over to bytes. And if we run binwalk on it, we then see all of the instruction entry points. And if we load it up in a reverse engineering tool, we will then pass the most important test, which is that most of the targets of function calls go to a function entry point. And that lets us know that we got all of these instructions in the right order rather than getting them backward or, uh, or screwing it up in some other way. Um, so that's how you get the secret mask ROM out of an NSA chip maybe a quarter century too late. But, um, if you would like to play around with these tools, I've got the source code to the CAD tool that performs this up on GitHub. It will link to it from maskromtool.com. It runs on um, uh, Mac, Windows, or Linux. I also have a tutorial where you yourself can sit down and you can work from beginning to end through recovering the ROM from a Game Boy. Uh, if anyone here is from Nintendo, please don't sue me. And the, um, the final piece is I have the full project files for the Clipper chip, the third generation one, the MYK82, um, so that you can read out the entire program, you can dump the entire program to a binary, and you do this on two separate markups of the chip, like two different photographic sets, so that you can compare the two. And if you make an error, you'll make a different error between them. Out of 100,000 bits, I found that I had 140 bits wrong. I was able to correct all of them, and I believe that this GitHub project has the entire firmware with perfect bit accuracy of almost 100 kilobits of code. So thank you for your time and attention. Um, Uh, if any of you have questions, we've got a microphone that can come around. Uh, just raise your hand and uh, you'll be chased. Hello. It's a very cool talk, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. You can feel free to answer whichever ones you find most interesting. Um, when you're reverse engineering, I saw you take off layers. 
do you, can you do that to one chip or do you have to have multiple chips that you're doing that to? Uh, second question is, is, is there, there anything chip manufacturers can do to prevent what you're attempting here? And third question is, can you give us an estimate of the error rate for every like rough step you take? So like picture to uh, sure. Like um, thank you. So for a small chip, like the for release by Beethoven, um, if you pay attention and you look at it very carefully, you can get every bit in that correct on a single attempt. As the number of bits begins to scale, you begin to not be able to focus on all of them at once. Like, I don't have a monitor large enough for me to see all 100,000 bits and to look at it visually and see, oh, that one's wrong. So. Scaling to 100,000 bits, I found that, um, like I, I measured it. So I, I marked up a ROM once, and then I, I did it two more times, and I corrected the errors in the, the latter two project files. So that now I have a perfect dump, and I found that in that, 140 bits of my original dump were wrong. Um, in the, the photography of the 100,000 bits, I had exactly one bit that I was not able to see visually. There was a little speck of dust on the die. And uh, I was able to figure out the correct value for that by disassembly. It was an illegal op code if it were a zero, but it was a valid instruction if it were a one. Therefore, even though I can't see it, I still know that it's a one, having all of the other bits in that word. Um, as far as like the, the processing risks, if you have a via ROM, which is visible from the surface, that's pretty reliable and safe to process. You boil it in acid, you're going to break the bond wires and stuff, but the, the glass that you get can be photographed easily, and if you made a mistake, you just clean it and you try again. When you're delayering for a diffusion ROM, this is where the, the bits are near the bottom of the chip and they're making or breaking a transistor that's above them. On those, um, the clarity of the picture will be reduced if you go too far. Um, but I've not found much risk in my chemical processing. So I usually do those one at a time and I usually expect to succeed. The third type um, are the implant ROMs. This is where the a difference between P-silicon and N-silicon, which is invisible to light, is uh, what contains the bit. For those, you need to stain them with something called a dash etch. Um, there's a recon talk from a few years back on how to do this for the um, copy protection chip in the Nintendo 64. On those, there are lots of little things that can go wrong that will completely ruin your sample and you will never be able to recover from. So, um, like, you need to time the exposure, you need to delayer down to exactly the right vertical position, um, you need to keep everything clean or one side will be legible and the other side will be screwed over. On those, uh, I have a kind of dismal success rate. I, I think I peaked at getting about a 50% success rate on those. And then I got some metal contamination in one of my chemical bottles, and I had a 0% success rate for a while where I kept doing it and it wasn't working. Um, it can be frustrating, but as you have a target that you care about, if you work far enough, you eventually figure it out. And like all other forms of reverse engineering, um, like incremental progress is better than the frustration of saying this doesn't work to hell with it, I'm done. Um, and as far as defenses go, like um, as you get to finer processes, the optical paths no longer work. Um, uh, Olivier in the back was doing um, a workshop here at Recon on how to do this with electron microscopy for those smaller ones, but that's currently beyond the capabilities of my lab. Can you talk about the microscope you're using? Yes. Um, so I've mentioned John McMaster a few times here. Um, he's like my friendly competitor in all of this. So he writes related tools. He also does this sort of work. Um, and when I decided to rebuild my chemistry lab, which I had let, um, like I, I, I tore it down when I left Pennsylvania years ago, and I just never got around to rebuilding it. And so um, shortly after COVID, I, I got a, a big house. I had a room that I could dedicate to this sort of stuff. 
I decided I was going to get back into it. And uh, John really helped me out as far as um, reminding me about the things that I had forgotten and explaining the things that had newly been discovered. Um, I bought an Amscope um, metallurgical microscope. It needs to be metallurgical, which means the light needs to go down the column rather than up through the sample. Um, so I, I bought a metallurgical microscope and I was getting these photographs and they were working. And then um, John calls me up one day and he says, dude, your microscope is crap. I'm sending you a better one. Um, he has a, a sort of a startup in the works and he was basically sending me one of the prototypes from it, which is a lot less than the final project will be, but it's uh, an Olympus metallurgical microscope with a motorized stage so that instead of having to manually turn the knobs and hold my breath to take these photographs, I can just tell the computer like, this is the bottom left corner, that's the top right corner. I want these to overlap by 30%. Tell me when it's done. Um, and that has been a tremendous help. So uh, God bless friendly competitors in the reverse engineering industry. Like, uh, any other questions? Thanks, uh, really, really nice talk. Um, I was curious if you've encountered any modern ROMs where they usually have additional columns for parity checks of sort, because then you could incorporate that into your error correction logic for your mass ROM tool. Um, I certainly can. The appropriate place to put that, though, is not within this tool, but within the subsequent tool that does the decoding. Um, at the moment, Zoram is the best tool for that. I'm working on a, a new tool in C++ as both a Unix command line and as a library. And when I care about a particular chip that has these checksum bits, then it will matter a lot to include them. Um, but until I find them, I, I have no use for them. Um, and it can sometimes be frustrating when you're looking at the chip and there is like an extra column or two, knowing that that's not a part of the data, that that's a part of something else and should be ignored. Um, sometimes they might be error correction bits, sometimes they might be like uh, flags for permission access, but you never really know until after you've gotten that ROM dump and read it and figured out more about how that chip works. Cool, thank you. What guides your choices of which chip ROM to uh, examine? Like, what inspires you? Um, so I have this disease late at night that involves um, alcohol and Twitter. And a lot of the, like, I, I got away from the political Twitter, so I don't have to deal with their crap. But um, there are a lot of really, really smart reverse engineers who do not give a damn about computer security and are instead doing it because there was some video game 30 years ago that was cool. Um, and I've been nerd sniped by a lot of these because um, when you get to like early musical instruments like uh, Casio electronic keyboards or like some video games, um, some of those are not electrically readable or if they are, it requires a test mode, the documentation for which has been lost. So ROM recovery for those is like the only effective way to get a copy of the ROM to begin emulating it. And I've been getting a lot of samples that way just by um, you know looking around and so until somebody mentions a chip that they'd like a firmware dump from, ordering three dozen of those from China, boiling them down in my lab, photographing them, and then seeing what happens next. Um, there are some frustrations there. Like if you're looking for an original project in reverse engineering, um, some of these instruction sets are kind of documented, but nobody has figured out the ordering of the ROM bits. And um, like y you can usually politely ask to get the photos, mark them up yourself, and then have the puzzle of figuring out the order, uh, which is not an impossible puzzle, but is too much trouble for someone who's not interested in that chip that you are. So. Um, if any of you care about old toys or something and you want to dump a ROM from it, just let me know. Uh, 
Um, I, also, if anybody knows of any other like crazy backdoor to cryptography chips, um, I'd love to dump the backdoors out of after all these years. So. All right, uh, I think that's it for questions. So thank you kindly, and um, I'll be out in the hallway. <laughs>